I won't explain here what a paranormal brokerage does, because officially they don't exist. But I will tell you what led me recently to offer a considerable amount of money to one to examine a certain set of objects, the Chilliam Witch photographs. The Chilliam Witch legend began in 1962 when there were two disappearances in the mountains near the North Carolina border within ten months of each other, with some striking similarities. Both of the vanished were men, hikers, young, obviously handsome, in unusually stellar physical shape, both of them intending to walk the back half of the 40-mile Aries Trail alone. Brown hair, blue eyes. Gone, without a trace, ten months apart. The forest in that area is deep and wide, and so, of course, the stories spiraled quickly out of control. The Chilean witch apparently had specific tastes in the men she supposedly abducted, used, and then devoured. In December of that year, the police there received a handwritten note in feminine handwriting, postmarked from the town of Gladden, 40 miles away. It said, I have killed your witch, but she still has power. Signed by someone calling herself Ilva. A crude map had been drawn on the other side of the note, marked by an X. The map generally outlined the path of the Aries Trail. The cartographer had even dotted it with trees in the shape of lowercase v's. A single very dubious detective volunteered to drive out to Chilliam and follow the map's route as his last bit of official business before heading off with his family for a three-day weekend. The backup caused by a car crash on the side road delayed him for more than an hour, and so it was full night by the time he had made it a mile and a half into the woods to the spot marked with the X. He was expecting to look around for fifteen minutes in the cold and find nothing. But in that spot, One of the very few benches in the entire forest had been altered. Someone had cocooned it entirely in a large, dark sheet, and they hadn't ended there. About two dozen tree branches several feet in length lay against the bench, seeming to protect it. These were found later to have been broken off nearby pines, probably by hand. The detective removed them and lifted the bench off the ground just enough to free the corners of the sheet, and then he lifted it and shone his flashlight downwards. The woman who had been placed on the bench was never identified. In age, she appeared to be about 30. She was dressed in what looked at first like very dirty and ragged hospital fatigues, and this was proven correct. A numbered label on them traced them to a hospital a hundred miles away, one which had not issued such a garment to its employees for more than twenty-five years. The woman had striking green eyes, and she had no hair anywhere on her body. The bottoms of her feet were so heavily tattooed they appeared almost black. The patterns described a dense weaving of vines. This last detail was concealed from the public to weed out false confessions. So, too, was the fact that there was a single, small thumbprint in the middle of her forehead. To the naked eye, it looked like it had been made in blood. But analysis revealed that it was composed entirely of varied and unrelated insect matter, as if someone had crushed a handful of them into a paste in order to leave this mark. The thumbprint's owner was never identified either. The coroner found no evidence of foul play whatsoever, or even abuse. The woman's life functions had simply ceased. The Aries Trail doesn't exist anymore, I probably don't have to tell you. This past March, I got a call from an associate who told me that the price to look at the Chilean Witch photographs had finally come within my acceptable range, and if I was willing... He could give me a cell phone number, and the process of seeing them could begin. Thanks partly to the gambling debts run up by a Bath County beat cop who wasn't even born when the legend took hold.
that's the way these things usually go. One person who can be bought because of a weakness. The seven photographs have been sealed inside a simple manila envelope and officially lost by a clumsy detective who, in actuality, had known exactly what he was doing, who had come to understand the rather distressing problem with them. And one night this past May, I was able to drive to a very nice conference room in a building in Washington, D.C., owned by Citibank, where the photographs could be examined while a woman in a gray business suit, whose name I was not allowed to know, stood outside the door, waiting to usher me back out onto K Street after a maximum of 15 minutes had gone by. The monetary transaction that secured me this permission went through PayPal. Exactly eight of the two dozen or so people in law enforcement and evidence preparation who had laid eyes on those photographs back in 1962 had gone insane. Not cinematically, no, though they were all taken ill in some form immediately. It was easy enough to ascribe their attacks to job stress, and so that was what was done. But there were five suicide attempts over the ensuing four years, and a total of 24 separate incidents of hospitalization for depression, paranoia, dissociative episodes, and extreme paradoxical insomnia. The evidence photographs inside the manila envelope had in common exactly one thing, which was that the unidentified female's stark green eyes could be seen in them. They were all headshots of the body. These were the ones that most of the eight sufferers described at various times to their doctors over the years. So I had a one in three chance of becoming like them if I opened that envelope. I had a one in three chance of inexplicably seeing my own face in those photographs, my own body on that bench, a photographic image of my own corpse, so vivid and lasting that it would eat my mind away no matter how many drugs doctors might hook me on. The curse of the unidentified Chilliam Witch was to always see oneself in those pictures. When I was alone with the envelope, I went to the window and looked down on the street below. It was ten o'clock on a Friday night. Couples were headed out to bars, shivering, laughing, having no idea what this world holds if you look into just the right places, if you wait and watch and listen. The red-haired woman who let me in and was standing guard had her back to the glass wall. She had only one hand for some reason, not even an artificial one to replace it. I'd been told the photographs hadn't been examined in 15 years. My affairs were in order. So I turned the conference room lights up a little higher, using the dimmer on the wall. And I sat down and peeled back the piece of scotch tape. I really only need to describe one of the photos, which was in fact the first one to be developed properly. The first one anybody ever saw of the corpse of the Chilean witch in 1962. The crime scene photographer had crouched to her eye level. She was lying on her stomach, her forehead, marked with that thumbprint, turned toward the trail, her eyes wide open and staring. If you close your eyes right now, your imagination will fill in the blanks, because I'm sure you know what the lighting in the picture is like. It was late at night in the dark winter woods and the photographer had to use a primitive bright flash. And so, in the foreground, the dead woman is staring into the lens, her face washed out and colorless on the old film. Behind her, you can see details of the sheet the entire bench was wrapped in. That detail tapers off quickly. You can see by the light of the flash bulb the branches of the closest tree. But the rest of the frame behind that is just blackness, infinite nothingness. 
As a child, I was always riveted by that effect of the flash, creating a bordering dark around people so deep it offered a mystery in even the happiest photograph, as if the dark were reaching out to surround men, women, children. No, I did not see myself in that crime scene photograph. The face I saw remained that of the dead Chilean witch. I stared at it for 30 seconds, and then I looked away, waiting, sitting in that comfortable leather conference room chair. I heard a playful shout down on the street, some college kid telling another one to run for a cab. I had survived. Whatever twitch of psychology led those others into some abyss, I just do not possess it. One day I suppose I'll tell you a story that isn't ever followed in time by another. And you'll know by my apparently endless absence that I was once again contacted about something being made available ever so briefly through that brokerage in Warsaw. And I paid what I had to pay. Except things did not go as planned. But at least I met my end knowing something you never will.